Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this online VLEVA session on the Freight Transport Greening Package. In a moment, this package will be presented by Mr. Christian Schmidt, Director Land Transport at DG Move. Dan Lodeberg Kinderen, Director of Transport and Logistic Vlaanderen, will expl explain why this package is so important for his sector. There will be room for questions after both speakers. These questions can be asked through the question box. Please phrase your questions in English. Now I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Schmidt. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Celeste, and uh, good morning to all the participants. Um, I'm in a studio here in Vlieva, so I apologize. I don't have my European flag with me, um, but I'm Christian Schmidt, Director for Land Transport at the European Commission, and I'm here to talk about the uh, greening freight package that was adopted by the Commission on the 11th of uh, July. So first, let's set the scene. As you know, the European Green Deal calls for a 90% reduction uh, in greenhouse gas emissions for transport um, in by 2050, and uh, for that, uh, the Commission adopted a uh, sustainable and smart mobility strategy uh, in December 2020, uh, transport is one of the economic sectors that is not yet peaking in terms of CO2 emissions, and therefore um, we need to work um, on that. Uh, and turning to freight, uh, freight, well, uh, freight is uh, responsible for more than 30% of CO2 emissions in the transport sector. It's also a very important economic sector. Uh, the sector in Europe uh, employs more than 6 million people. And of course, uh, whether we are in the middle of Corona or not, uh, uh, the freight sector is essential uh, for maintaining uh, uh, goods in our shops and for the single market. So for all these reasons, the Commission um, is very much aware of the importance of the freight sector um, and the greening that needs to, to happen. Hence this package that was adopted in July. Um, package because it uh, consists of a number of elements. Um, it has uh, um, a proposal on rail management and capacity management, I'll come back to that. It has a um, revision of the Directive on Weights and Dimensions for trucks, and uh, I'll start with that. Um, and then uh, it also uh, uh, proposes a new methodology for counting emissions called Count Emissions EU. Uh, these are the three uh, um, proposals that were adopted in July, but part somehow of the uh, policy mix is also uh, still to come, uh, a proposal for the revision of the com Combined Transport Directive, and we are also working on a proposal to revise the directive on train drivers, uh, and later on digital automatic couplings for uh, for trains. So you can see a lot of our on our plate that uh, uh, relates to, uh, uh, to 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 freight. Um, a short uh, um, word on the balance between road and rail. Um, and, and just let me give you the, the figures uh, from 2010 to 2020, uh, road uh, transport freight increased by 12% in the European Union uh, in terms of ton per kilometer, ton, ton kilometers. For rail, the, that increase was only uh, 1%. Um, so you can see there is certainly not or not yet a modal shift uh, from road uh, to rail. And I think there may be a number of explanations for that. First of all, of course, the underlying market trends. In Europe, for decades, we carry by freight less bulk uh, uh, products, um, heavy goods uh, that are easily uh, transported by rail, and more just-in-time uh, inputs uh, and, of course, consumer goods. And so uh, this is probably why, uh, certainly, we forecast uh, that the demand for road transport is not declining. Uh, on the on the contrary, it is increasing. Um, uh, and and certainly, uh, since I'm director both for road and rail, uh, rail has to uh, become a lot more efficient in order to take uh, a greater market uh, share. Therefore, when we talk about greening freight, we're not talking about some sort of forced shift from road to rail. No, we're talking about making all modes greener um, and more uh, efficient. So with that uh, sort of uh, clarification, let me turn to the actual proposals. Uh, the first of which then is the Weights and Dimensions Directive for uh, uh, Trucks. And then, of course, the proposal has been adopted, so you can you can see all the details uh, in our proposal. Um, so I will I will stay with the the main principles. 
So first of all, 96% um, uh, of all trucks in the EU are currently uh, still running on, on diesel um, and heavy duty vehicles um, represent 28% of all road transport uh, emissions. And therefore it is important uh, that we see a faster uptake of green technologies for our trucks. Uh, but at the same time, of course, you all know, uh, those who are active in this market, it is a fully liberalized market across the European Union. Competition is fierce and the, um, let's say, the, the profit margins uh, for many uh, companies in the haulage sector are rather low. So very difficult. I know also a lot of SMEs. Uh, um, so very hard to uh, uh, sort of shift dramatically from one day to the other to zero emission vehicles, battery electric driven trucks, uh, heavy investments, etc. And therefore, <clears throat> the Commission felt that um, instead of sort of imposing mandatory targets uh, uh, only, we should also try to, with our legislation, leverage it, it to give incentives uh, for um, companies, manufacturers, to put in place uh, uh, affordable zero emission vehicle technology. And that's uh, what we can do with this um, weights and dimension uh, both also, uh, because there are, there are three strands and the first one um, is that if you want to introduce zero emission vehicle technology you would with this proposal be allowed the extra weight that is necessary uh, the, the, the past revision of the directive attempted to do so um, but clearly the incentive wasn't strong enough for operators uh, and manufacturers to invest in this technology well now uh, with climate change this has become more urgent um, and therefore, our proposal is that uh, heavy duty vehicles uh, that are zero emissions should be allowed four tons extra weight. Um, or if it's hydrogen, uh, where you need to put the tank often behind the cabin, uh, 90 centimeters uh, extra. Uh, this is what we have understood also from manufacturers that are, are putting these uh, uh, products uh, 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 on the market. Um, these are the incentives that uh, could. Uh, make this uh, uh, irrelevant. Um, we are also uh, uh, very keen to promote intermodal uh, transport operations. So uh, let's say road the first leg to a an intermodal terminal, um, and then onto uh, rail if it's long distance across uh, uh, Europe. Um, and for that reason, we have also in the directive uh, suggested to include all intermodal transport operations within the scope. Um, and also allow uh, four tons extra uh, payload uh, for um, operations that are uh, in an intermodal uh, uh, transport operation. Then as a, also uh, on the uh, intermodality, we are proposing to increase the height of uh, vehicles, high cubed containers, uh, uh, eliminating the need for special uh, equipment, the so-called low wheel trailers, in order to allow these uh, containers uh, that are intermodal, can go from a truck to uh, uh, a wagon on rail, um, that they can be higher. So these are the decarbonization incentives um, that we uh, propose. But we also noted uh, when looking and evaluating the functioning of the market, um, that uh, uh, we needed a little bit more harmonization also on the rules. So for instance, uh, for the so-called European modular systems, or gigaliners, as some call them. Um, as you may know, member states for the moment allow them on a national basis, and between member states that allow them, cross-border operations um, are allowed, but on the basis of bilateral agreements. We are proposing to allow cross-border transport of uh, European modular systems that are longer and sometimes heavier <clears throat> across uh, uh, borders between uh, uh, allowing um, member states. Um, on the EMS or Gigaliners, if you wish, we have made a very careful analysis. Uh, we um, are convinced that uh, they are no threat to road safety uh, for a number of reasons. They stay on, let's say, the core network where they are not coming into contact with uh, vulnerable road users, cyclists and, uh, um, uh, and pedestrians. Um, also, of course, they help address uh, the driver shortage uh, that um, participants from the industry will be aware of. Um, you can uh, transport the same amount of goods with uh, fewer drivers uh, if you use uh, EMS. And also uh, there is a definitely uh, a greening effect of EMS. 
that can be calculated uh, around 20-25% um, because you, lease, you need less journeys um, um, for the same amount of goods transported. So decarbonization, harmonization, but then also of course uh, enforcement um, where uh, let's say the fragmentation of the rules have led to different practices and therefore uncertainty for the operators. So uh, uh, for instance on uh, the number of, of checks on, uh, on maximum weight and uh, etc. Uh, we are proposing to introduce an obligation on member states to perform a minimum number of controls uh, for compliance. Um, we are proposing to make those controls easier with way in motion systems um, rather than stopping. Um, and these way in motion systems should be every 300 kilometers on the 10 T, so the Trans European Network to improve the effectiveness and enforcement of targeted controls. This isn't, isn't just for road safety and protect wear and tear, but it's also a question of level playing field that everybody is playing uh, by the same uh, rules. That uh, select in a nutshell is the weights and dimension uh, proposal. Um, but as you can see, uh, we believe road transport will remain an indispensable part of transport uh, in the European Union, but we need to strengthen the incentives for faster decarbonization um, for better uh, combining road with rail um, uh, and and that leads me uh, to the second uh, proposal in the package uh, namely uh, um, a regulation uh, that we have called count emission EU to compare how are uh, different transport modes uh, emitting uh, CO2 uh, uh, you may all know that you can easily on the internet find all sorts of gimmicks to calculate your emissions from a flight or from a road trip. Uh, you, you, you might think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's either fun or necessary for marketing, etc., to um, calculate your green credentials. But there is a lot of greenwashing um, going on, and if the methodologies are not, uh, 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 let's say, comparable and reliable, then of course uh, you may uh, uh, see that those uh, calculations are not really reliable. Um, so we have proposed a standardized formula, a way of calculating emissions based on international standards, ISO standards, uh, for the use by transport companies, operators uh, and transport providers. It's not mandatory, but um, it is a first step of putting some order uh, in uh, what companies might communicate about uh, emissions. And so if you do report on that, then uh, reporting should be done um, uh, with this um, methodology. Uh, we think this tool is, uh, is very timely. Uh, some companies are, of course, already gathering a lot of primary data on their emissions. Um, and therefore, uh, we think this uh, uh, um, uh, methodology uh, will be useful. It will also be user-friendly and of course uh, as I said earlier we know there are a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises in these in this area. Uh, for those there are let's say standard emission default values that can be applied so um, it is easier uh, uh, to use them potentially then to be checked by the European Environmental Agency um, but we are aware that uh, not everybody has uh, uh, statisticians and uh, mathematicians uh, in their headquarters to do these calculations. So we have made it easy. Um, the third part of the package uh, of the green freight uh, proposal is the regulation on the use of uh, railway infrastructure capacity. Um, um, as you probably uh, know, uh, freight, rail freight um, is only efficient on the longer distances. And therefore, something like 50% um, of all freight trains uh, cross borders. Um, which is which is good, but it's also a challenge um, because um, organizing such long distance train paths means coordinating from one member state to the other on allocating the train path uh, so they match each side of the border. Uh, obviously, um, you undermine the efficiency and the reliability, the punctuality um, of rail freight if a, if a freight train has to stop um, at the border. And that's unfortunately what is happening uh, for the moment. Um, member states are operating their networks um, um, a bit too much as um, islands. Um, and when freight has to be uh, allocated a, a train path, um, it's often the last client. Um, you get the poorest quality um, and uh, therefore not the continuity 
and therefore the efficiency of the operations. With this regulation, the Commission uh, intends to shift from the current situation, uh, where you could say it's man managed um, uh, in, a, in an, uh, a national manner, but also in an annual manner, um, and not with the right time horizon, and also it is organized manually. So annually, nationally, and uh, uh, manually, we want to um, uh, shift that to a more flexible, digital, and truly integrated European way of organizing uh, our train uh, um, path. There's a lot of detail that goes into the governance of that, making sure the infrastructure managers work together, but I can uh, leave that for questions if there are questions of, of interest uh, to that. Um, but uh, this uh, is a quite significant proposal in the sense that um, congestion um, is already a reality on many parts of the of, of the network. You try to go through the Rhine Valley with a freight train, and you will see uh, that it's not so uh, not so easy. But also nodes around Europe, um, and it takes time to build new uh, capacity. We calculate that uh, with better management of the capacity, the network that we currently have. Um, you could release something like 4% additional capacity for trains to circulate. Now, 4% may not sound like a, um, um, a high figure to, to you, but 4% of the network, um, if you uh, convert that into what would it cost to build 4% additional network, you are into the billions and billions of euros. Um, and so, therefore, and you get this result uh, right away with better uh, management. So, this is certainly something that will help, together with a lot of other measures, improve um, the efficiency of rail freight um, in Europe. And then, as I said in my uh, first remarks, uh, uh, it only grew by 1% in the last 10 years. Uh, and if we want to ship uh, goods from road to rail, uh, we have to do a lot to make it more efficient in order to be competitive. And with that, um, uh, I stop. Uh, this is the package. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of other things that goes into making freight efficient. Uh, things that were adopted before the package, such as the infrastructure, the 10T network, very important, the regulation on the 10T network, um, and others that are still to, to come. Um, but I'll stop there, and uh, thank you very much for listening. Back to you, Celeste. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt, for your interesting presentation. Uh, we will now go on with some questions that came in. Questions can still be asked through the question box. Uh, the first question is, what are the expect expectations for the negotiations? Is the proposal expected to be sharply weakened? So, okay, you hear me? I'm just checking that, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Well, my expectation is that this is done immediately, but of course, uh, uh, it's in the hands of the Council and uh, of Parliament. I would say the package has been very well received by the stakeholders, um, and we have already uh, been assigned uh, um, rapporteurs, so uh, responsible members of Parliament uh, dealing with it. In Council, uh, the Spanish presidency has uh, clearly said that the weights and dimensions uh, directive is a priority for them and uh, we are into already uh, I think the third or the fourth reading of uh, articles uh, in the working groups um, and the Sp Spanish presidency uh, hopes to uh, adopt uh, what is called a general approach or so a first uh, agreement on the council's position during their presidency so before the end of the year um, and that would then allow us to start um, trilogues um, um, talks between the Parliament and the, and the Council. But this, of course, even in the fastest possible scenario, uh, will not be concluded before uh, Parliament goes into uh, elections. Um, so uh, we will go as fast as we can. Um, I think all the stakeholders are aware that these uh, issues are unnecessary and urgent for decarbonizing of, um, of transport. Um, but um, yeah, uh, certainly the Commission is eager that this goes as fast as possible and the package has been very well received. Uh, I was very pleased to see. Uh, of course, there will always be amendments and proposals, but overall, I, I, I think it was well received by the, by the sector and by the, uh, by the institutions. Thank you. Okay, uh, for now we have one more question. In what way does this package seek to strengthen the European single market? 
Well, I think we all remember um, um, lockdown, Corona, and actually the only um, uh, the only people who were circulating are the people in the sector. Were the people in the sector? Um, uh, so we had the green lanes um, imposed, uh, so that our truck drivers, despite uh, the various uh, uh, restrictions. Uh, vaccinations, yes or no, and checks at the border, that they could actually cross the border. So I think uh, the, 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 the corona crisis showed us how important freight is to the backbone of our single market. Uh, and I, I think that was a lesson to, uh, learned to, uh, for, for everyone. Um, it's absolutely clear that if uh, we have a single market, uh, not just for consumer goods, but also for uh, production, uh, so inputs uh, between companies from one country to the other, uh, the competitiveness of our freight sector will also have an impact on the competitiveness of our manufacturing sector overall. And as you probably know, um, there is a lot of talk about reindustrializing Europe, uh, or at least sort of uh, securing uh, our uh, autonomy um, uh, in a globalized trade world, but our autonomy uh, um, in a uh, sort of uncertain geopolitical situation uh, and for that secure critical supply chains um, and for that um, we need a vibrant competitive but also green uh, uh, freight sector in Europe so sorry a long answer to say very important it's very important for the single market Okay, thank you. I think there are all questions for now. Then we go on um, to our next and last speaker for today, Mr. Lodewijk Kinderen from Transport and Logistiek Vlaanderen. The floor is yours. Yes, good morning everybody and I would very much like to thank Vleva for organizing this event um, because it gives us a, a unique opportunity to be talking about this very, very important proposal. Um, before I go into details, um, I would like to, to repeat and uh, stress upon the importance of some of the factors that has all, have already been uh, pointed at, i.e. Uh, the fact that the road haulage sector is a sector uh, which is by definition uh, active on a very international and a very competitive market. Um, in the case of my organization, Transport and Logistiek Vlaanderen counts over 1,500 members, um, a various range of companies whose focus is on working um, in the goods transportation sector uh, for third account. And typically, as stated by Mr. Schmidt, uh, an SME sector. Uh, just to give you the figure, uh, the average transport company by road in Flanders has 7.3 trucks. So it's a really very small operator. Uh, the margins are very low. Uh, and as pointed out, uh, it was clear during the lockdowns, we are indispensable for the uh, internal market. Um, furthermore, um, I would like, uh, before I go towards my presentation, I would like to repeat that um, on one hand, economic growth is fostered by all parties involved in the European Union, um, and uh, so do we, of course. But um, as a consequence, the emissions coming from road transport are directly derived from that growth, uh, giving us the market share in emissions that we have and making the challenge all the more difficult. Um, indeed, uh, we do rely uh, for over 95% on burning diesel while we are riding our trucks. So coming towards the presentation, um, I will be putting 100% focus on the directive in, in weights and, and dimensions um, that has been uh, pointed out by Mr. Schmidt. And I will be giving uh, a couple more uh, elements of detail and of course, the first reaction, um, the position of uh, Transport and Logistics Flanders with respect to that proposal. Um, in general terms, um, we very much welcome the principles, actually, uh, we, we have been demanding uh, for a very long time uh, for these principles to be put in place, um, for it, it does mean a huge step forward. It takes away a number of boundaries uh, that today 
uh, are not um, are not an allowing zero emission vehicles to develop to be put on the market. It does enhance uh, combined transport, and very importantly, uh, but I'll be going into more detail. It clarifies rules for European modular system in border crossings. Um, Giga liners, Mr. Schmidt pointed out, uh, we also call them easily uh, long and heavy vehicles, um, and it, it does make uh, enforcement more efficient. To be, be to be very brief, um, for the sector, uh, we consider this to be the best improvement in decades, and it is indeed a revision of a directive in 1996 that imposed on member states a minimum standard. I, I really want to repeat that over and over again, not maximum standards, but minimum standards um, to allow international vehicles to ride upon. Um, first, and uh, not pointed out by uh, Mr. Schmidt, is the, the issue of the 44 tons border crossings. Um, actually, um, um, some of the member states have national standards for um, trucks laid at 44 tons instead of the European minimum uh, of 40 tons. Um, and until today, it was either unclear or not allowed just to cross the border, even if two neighboring member states allowed uh, 44 tons as a standard for, uh, for a European truck. Um, when the uh, commission proposal will be accepted, um, those two member states who authorize uh, the 44 tons nationally will be obliged to also uh, authorize the border crossing. And that is something hugely important, uh, actually, uh, for my members whose first market is the French market. This is hugely important. We've been demanding this application ever since France went towards the 44 tons instead of 40 tons. So that, that is really uh, 20 plus years of sustained advocacy uh, of which we hope uh, that the Parliament and the Council will improve. Uh, quite simply, um, it's a very, very simple no-brainer. It's a CO2 reduction potential, which is enormous. And um, other than uh, with the European modular system, also this uh, decision uh, is a partial answer to driver shortage. Um, that is something we are convinced of. Um, um, this uh, is also enhanced um, when you're in intermodal transport, then uh, the weight might be up to 48 tons, which is a very positive measure as well. Uh, the only negative aspect that we see, or at least an aspect with a question mark, is that this, uh, this measure will expire uh, at the end of 2034 for uh, vehicles with an internal combustion engine meaning that uh, the European Commission is today confident that uh, zero emission vehicles uh, that are applied in that subsector, um, uh, so in, in the international and heavy goods, uh, will be, let's say, completely market ready. Um, we're not quite convinced that this will be the case. It is not, uh, not completely today. And obviously, there's also the issue of the existing fleet. Uh, you, you can't have an SME allow an investment and three or four years later say, now the rules are changed and um, this kind of transportation operation is no longer possible. But overall, this is something which is very much welcomed. Um, this border crossing uh, is a huge step forward. So thank you very much, European Commission, and hopefully the other institutions um, will, um, uh, will really make no modifications uh, in a negative way in that proposal. Um, second uh, important aspect for our members is the border crossing for the European modular system. Um, it has been pointed out by Mr. Schmidt. Um, it's something we very much welcome for today. Um, uh, this is something that's only possible on the basis of a bilateral agreement also um, within member states that already apply this um, this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this allows, um, under certain conditions, vehicles up to 25 meters and 25 centimeters uh, to drive on a specif specific national network. Uh, so it, it may be possible to do that also with border crossings, uh, obviously with a neighboring member state who also allows it. 
and under the conditions that are stated by uh, the respective men member states. Um, for example, this is not allowed on the complete network um, and um, we make sure that there is no reverse modal shift and that um, there is no negative impact on uh, the conditions of uh, traffic safety. Um, one little question mark here is that uh, it is foreseen for this measure to be a trial for five years. Uh, one could wonder um, if the five years lead to a positive um, evaluation, um, is it not logic that the prolongation would be automatic? So this is, this is something that might be added, uh, just, this, just this detail that we don't have to go through the complete political process again after five years uh, of, of positive evaluation. By the way, uh, a number of member states have applied these vehicles on a larger scale and have had uh, nothing but positive experiences um, with respect to and in comparison to the normal uh, vehicles. So yes, indeed, also here the CO2 reduction potential per ton kilometer moved is really quite essential, uh, is quite considerable, and uh, this is something we very much welcome. Then I go towards uh, the higher vehicle mass um, for zero emission vehicles. Um, that limit was and is until today at 42 tons. Um, it's it's uh, heightened, it's put upwards to 44 tons, regardless of the weight of the zero emission, emission technology. And uh, this is something which is also welcomed uh, for the matter is quite clear. If you today buy a zero emission vehicle, um, it will cost you three, anywhere between three and four times the price of a diesel combustion engine. So it's really a huge burden uh, for zero emission vehicles uh, to be to be uh, competitive. Um, when we dream, uh, we might might also dream about the times when the zero emission technology evolves that much that um, the, the the lighter weight will allow tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, so to speak, uh, more payload for these zero emission vehicles than uh, for the vehicles with an internal combustion engine. And that, ladies and gentlemen, um, that might become uh, a game changer. That might become uh, something very, very important. And then there's a little technical detail. Um, the zero emission vehicles um, are allowed to have other um, axle weight maxima. Uh, this might be necessary as um, uh, one or more uh, OEMs are developing uh, zero emission vehicles where the technology and the battery is really put into the axle, um, uh, allowing a very low gravity point, which is good for traffic uh, safety, but um, having uh, somewhat heavier uh, axle weights uh, as a consequence thereof. So I think this might also be needed and should be accepted by the member states uh, as a consequence of their choices to, uh, to impose uh, the trends towards zero emission vehicles. Um, then I go towards um, the extra weight and, and height in terms of intermodal transport. Obviously, my members, uh, although being road uh, transport operators, um, they also, um, some of them are very active into combined transport, have even made uh, their specialization of combined transport. Um, so the extra four tons uh, per vehicle that are in any way uh, attributed to intermodal transport operations um, is, is something which is very much welcomed, uh, which is very positive. Um, the, the height that Mr. Schmidt was talking about, um, uh, instead of uh, the traditional height of four meters, um, the height for intermodal operations of high cube containers, however, um, is, is something that my organization uh, had not asked for. Um, for these, uh, these operations, uh, these operations of um, high cube containers have been on the market either in intermodal transport or uh, in other operations. And uh, those operations were possible with specific equipment that um, and basically comes down to a, uh, a chassis um, uh, of, of a vehicle which was a little bit lower 
than the standard chassis. So there we say, um, if you use the specialized equipment, it is possible to do that within the four meter limit. Uh, so here's, here's the one thing uh, of the proposal that we say, we don't need that. Uh, this, this really was not uh, necessary for uh, the, the operators um, who um, affiliate uh, TLV. Um, then I go to one uh, very specific, specific detail on, on vehicle transport. So if you're transporting cars or, or, or trucks, but specifically cars in this example, uh, you, see, you see that kind of vehicle on the picture on the left side. Um, the maximal length uh, is brought up to 20 meters and 75 centimeters. And furthermore, um, at the front, there is a load extension allowed um, of half a meter and a back extension of 1.5 meter. Obviously, the vehicles have to rest on the vehicle and only the back and the front side of the vehicles uh, ha have been allowed some extensions. Um, this practice was already applied in some member states, but um, the proposal of the European Commission uh, would bring uniformity, uh, would bring something much better. And here, the CO2 reduction potential um, is that of just putting one or even two more vehicles, cars, passenger cars, on a single truck. So you can imagine that uh, the amount of journeys that are saved is really uh, something very, very much important. And the efficiency increase is also uh, very important. Um, then I go towards the aerodynamics and towards the length more specific. Um, the existing uh, cab length extension um, used to be applied uh, for direct vision uh, and used to be applied uh, for, um, for, the, for the safety and the, the aerodynamics. Uh, the Commission proposal now also proposes that the, um, the, the extra length of the cabin may be used for zero emission technology installment. So um, these 90 centimeters Mr. Schmidt uh, was talking about are really necessary, so we are told, for the installment of hydrogen tanks behind the cab, the extra space all, all, um, is not there for extra payload. It's there uh, just to allow the uh, hydrogen or maybe other technologies to be, de to be developed uh, without losing the payload. So no false competition uh, is at stake here. Uh, we esteem that this is also a very positive uh, thing. Um, I'm already coming to my conclusions. Um, and um, I, I come towards um, some of the things um, that we've already said. Um, this is a very, very positive uh, proposal, which is very warmly welcomed by TLV and its members um, with, with just uh, a, a, a small number of points of attention, uh, i.e. the 44 uh, tons border crossing beyond 2034. We're not sure if it's going to be ready. Um, uh, the fact that EMS border crossings uh, will need an evaluation uh, and not, are not automatically applied in a, a general conditions after a positive evaluation. And uh, there's no need, as already stated, for the high cube containers um, height extension. Um, and then there's one more little point of attention, um, which um, I haven't talked about. Um, in some uh, transport operations, uh, it is not possible to unload the truck at premises where a forklift uh, is available. Therefore, in these specific situations, a forklift is often, um, a portable forklift is also taken along with the truck. At, it's actually put at the back side of the truck. Some member states um, consider uh, this portable forklift as part of the load with a load extension possibility um, we would uh, esteem it to be necessary, to be useful, to, um, to uniform that and to put that uh, extension principle of 1.5 meters also in the directive so that all member states apply it in the exact same manner. So uh, having uh, come towards the end, uh, this, is, this is really uh, the, the basics once again, thank you very much, uh, Vleva, for the invitation. Thank you very much, European Commission, for the proposals. And obviously, uh, I'm, uh, I'm open for questions right now. And here are my contact details, should anyone 
uh, after the meeting um, wanted to get in touch. So it's back to you, um, uh, Celeste, um, to continue the meeting. Thank you, Lode, for your very interesting presentation. We can now go on with some questions that came in. Uh, questions can be asked through the question box. The first one is, do you think more European funding should be made available for small businesses that can't afford this green transition? Obviously, a, a very interesting question. Um, it's quite clear that um, uh, over 95% of the clients of road transport um, uh, refuse to pay uh, even a, a cent extra per kilometer uh, for, for, for the transition towards uh, greener transport. So um, if they don't want to do it, uh, then the solution lies elsewhere. Um, we have made a number of simulations and um, almost all of these simulations point out that um, there is even with a, loss, a lot of, uh, let's say, fiscal advantages for, um, for heavy duty trucks um, running uh, with zero emission uh, propulsions. Um, we believe that the only um, sustainable, economically sustainable solution today is that of, um, of a subsidy at, um, at the moment of acquisition of the vehicle. So uh, as of today, the answer is yes, we need funding. Um, and some member states uh, have decided upon funding, um, uh, others haven't, or um, let's say that at least that not all member states have uh, decided upon the same amount of funding. I give the example of Germany, where the, um, the, 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 the state of Germany uh, subsidizes 80% of, the, um, of the, the, the difference between the cost of a zero emission vehicle and uh, a diesel engine, uh, whereas um, other member states uh, like Flanders, uh, like Belgium, uh, only subsidize 40%. So this is obviously also a very important competition issue. Uh, I believe that uh, the European Commission should safeguard uh, the, the fair competition, i.e. The, the internal market conditions um, so it might do so by taking over uh, the the, the uh, interventions, um, and um, I must I must warn that um, the funds that are necessary to deploy the the greener the zero emission vehicles, the funds that are necessary are obviously very important. Looking at the sheer size of um, yeah the millions of trucks that run on our European roads. Um, so it is an issue that should be addressed, and I think that the European Commission should address this issue also by funding. I hope this answers the question. Thank you. Another question, are the requir requirements of AFIR also applicable to these bigger and heavier trucks? Well, obviously, um, AFIA requirements impose on member states to, um, to have a minimum of uh, alternative fuel um, um, supply uh, along the core 10T network and, and other places. Um, it's, it's a matter of uh, avoiding the chicken and egg uh, discussion. Um, and I believe that AFIA will help uh, to, to partially solve uh, these issues, uh, although um, uh, independently from the uh, measures that impose these minima on the member states, um, there should be also uh, a, a market um, a market way in order to to allow these vehicles to develop. Uh, however, if if you're looking at, for example, a 44-ton truck crossing a border instead of a 40-ton crossing a border, it makes absolutely no difference in terms of what kind of load infrastructure is needed. Um, it does make a difference if you're looking at a European modular system, um, and this is, this is something um, that is already a challenge, uh, let's say, at the level of member states. I don't think that, um, uh, that there's a, a bigger challenge uh, coming, from, coming from AFIR or going towards AFIR. Uh, it's just a challenge of uh, if you allow a vehicle on your network, you should also allow the driver to respect um, the resting times and to put at disposal uh, enough spaces. But that would lead us to another problem altogether, 
Um, but no, I don't think there is a fundamental uh, issue within AFIR. Okay, then we go on to the last question for now. Do you think that the additional weight and height now added in the proposal is enough since using zero emission technologies also carries a lot of weight? Well, um, I don't have a, a crystal ball, so I don't, I don't know the answer uh, precisely. And um, obviously the OEMs, um, uh, either they don't know or they don't want to say uh, if it's going to be enough. What I do know is that the density in, in the case of uh, battery electric vehicles, that the density of batteries um, has uh, dramatically increased over just a period of four years, uh, which is obviously needed uh, for, for, um, for trucks uh, on battery uh, uh, electric, electricity to, 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 even be, uh, to even be possible. So my answer is that I don't know where we will be in, in two years or in five years, let alone 10 years time. Um, there, uh, obviously, TLV is technology. Uh, it, it, our approach is, is, is technology neutral. Um, uh, I think that the current uh, directive proposal uh, is a very, very um, uh, balanced and positive um, aspect. And I believe that it, it might play uh, an important role, um, but I'm not sure when that when the development of zero emission vehicles uh, will really um, mean a breakthrough. The one thing is sure, um, there is no TCO parity as, to, as of today, and I believe that this TCO parity will not be reached with only the proposals of the directive. Um, I think it's, it, it, it might be reached once again uh, by the subventions, by the subsidies. Okay, thank you for your clear answers. Um, with this a little sooner than foreseen, we have already come to the end of this VLEVA session. I would like to thank all the attendees. I would also like to thank again our speakers today. The recording of this session and the PowerPoint will be made available at our website. All attendees will receive an email with information about that. Thank you and until next time. Bye-bye.